Okay, good morning everyone. Thank you for joining class. Good to see Asha and Susan, Sri Kumar, Christopher, Harrison and Kong. We'll begin class. Uh, before we begin class, can one of you lead us in prayer please? Anyone? Can anyone lead us in prayer? Yeah, thank you Asha. Dear God, thank you so much for this day, Lord, as we're about to learn the Book of Romans, that you fill us with your wisdom and knowledge, that we may grasp the truth and understand what you've done in the life of Paul and the believers at the great um, the Roman Church. God, thank you so much for everything. And I pray that as Pastor Sonia is teaching us, Lord, that we may understand and fill her with your wisdom as she's teaching us, God. Pour out your spirit in her as she teaches and bless her life and keep her safe, Lord. Thank you for everything you're doing. And you may pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Asha. Okay, so last week we were, uh, uh, on Friday, we looked at. Uh, began looking at uh, Romans chapter 2 and in chapter 2 we see that Paul is addressing both uh, is basically addressing uh, the Jewish believers even though um, the church at Rome comprised of uh, Jews and Greeks or Jews and Gentiles and uh, uh, but here we see in chapter 2 he's uh, you know uh, a small part of it or or the major part of it he's addressing it to the jewish believers now jews came from a very strong background of law and circumcision and uh, you know they were proud that they had the law the covenants uh, the circumcision uh, ritual and or the, the 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 covenant of circumcision uh, but now they have embraced uh, christ and um, so they're trying to figure out how all of this fits in their, uh, you know, in their uh, new um, position as uh, Jews, but also those who believe in Jesus Christ. So we see that Paul is very logically addressing the Jewish believers here. Uh, he says, he's telling them, you have the law, uh, you teach the law, but you don't keep the law. Uh, and when you don't do it, it's of no uh, use, okay? Uh, so he goes on to talk about the judgment of God. And um, uh, he says that, you know, um, even though you take pride in the law, you Jews, you have the covenant of uh, circumcision, you teach the law. And because you know the law, you teach the law, you know what is right and wrong, and you don't keep the, then there is, it's of no use because you will be judged. And he talks about the judgment of God. And uh, he talks about the Gentiles who don't have the law, uh, but he says that they have the law of God in their hearts, which he refers to as the conscience. And then he says, you know, even though the Jews have the law and they'll be judged by the law and, you know, the Gentiles can't say that they don't uh, have the law and since they'll not be judged, they have their conscience. But uh, he says, finally, that both Jews and Gentiles will be judged according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to talk about uh, circumcision. Um, and he says that, uh, you know, the Jews are very proud about this covenant of circumcision. Uh, but he says that God is not interested in the circumcision that is of the flesh that is outward, but the circumcision of the heart. Okay. Um, so he's, he goes on to Paul goes on to say, a real Jew, somebody who is circumcised uh, towards God in their heart. So what basically Paul is saying is both Jews and Gentiles are sinners before God. You know, they've fallen short of uh, God's righteousness. And it's very interesting to see how Paul builds this up in uh, Romans chapter 2. So we'll uh, we look at Romans chapter 2, verses 11, 1 to 11, but uh, we just ask somebody to read that and then uh, we'll uh, move ahead. So can somebody quickly read Romans chapter 2, verses 1 to 11 for us, please? Romans chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Can I read the question? Sure, please. Thank, Thank you. you. Therefore, thou art 
inexcusable, O, o man, whosoever thou art, thou art the judgment for wherein thou judgest another, thou com condemnest thyself for thou that judges does it the same thing. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to the truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and do and doest the same that thou shalt escape the judgment of God, or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing the goodness of God, leadeth thee to repentance. But after thy hardness and the impenitent heart, the treasureth up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and, and revelation of righteous judgment of God. Who, all who will render to every man according to these deeds? To them who by the patient countenance in well doing seek for glory and honor and immor immortality eternal. But unto them are contentious and do not obey, do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness and indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil to the, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of person with God. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so we looked at verses 1 to 11 uh, on Friday, but just give you a, a kind of a, a recap of it and then we'll move on to uh, verses 12 to the end of the chapter. So Paul is saying here in verses 1 to 11 that Jews, you have the law, uh, you can teach uh, the law. And because you can teach the law, you can judge others because you know what is right and wrong because you know the law and you teach the law. So obviously, you know what is right and wrong. So you can judge, uh, judge others what they're doing is right or whether what they're doing is wrong. But he's saying, but if you are doing that yourself in, in spite of you knowing the law and you teaching the law, you yourself are doing uh, what is wrong. You're not practicing the same things. Then he's telling them, don't think that you're going to escape the judgment of God, because you will be judged uh, by the law that you don't keep. Okay, and then Paul says in verse four that um, you know the goodness of God leads to repentance, and he says you know um, uh, you know he's talking to us and he's saying we who know the word of God, okay, we once we know the word of God, we also know what is right and wrong. So obviously we can judge people. We will be quick to judge people when they do something that's. Uh, uh, wrong and uh, and we can point out to them that what they're doing is right or what they what they're doing is wrong but even as we do that you know uh, let's not forget that the goodness of god uh, leads to repentance that means we need to uh, correct people uh, in love show them mercy of course there is love and truth uh, show people the love and mercy of God, uh, uh, but also point them out the truth, which means that we don't, uh, we just show them, does not mean that we just show them love and care, but we don't condone sin or that uh, we must overlook or encourage sin. Uh, no, that's not uh, what Paul is trying to say here, that we need to deal with it, but we need to be gracious and loving to them. Uh, and do it in a loving, uh, gracious, merciful way, because we know that the goodness of God leads to um, repentance. And Paul is also saying in this verse is that you know God is a righteous judge, okay, um, and an impartial judge, and He's going to judge everyone according to their deeds. Um, and then he mentions here the deeds like seeking for their own glory, their own honor, their own immortality. He says, you know, you will be judged for your deeds. And twice he says here that, you know, uh, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. Now, why does he say this? First to the Jew, then to the Greek, because the Jews were the first, uh, will, be, will be judged first because they have the uh, law. So it was this... Um, 12 to 16, then he goes on uh, to talk about how everyone is going to be uh, judged. Okay, so he says, Jews, you'll be judged according to the law. Uh, Greeks, 
uh, or Gentiles, uh, you might not have the law, but don't think that you will not be judged, you will be judged. And then he goes on to talk about in verses 12 to uh, 16, how everyone will be um, judged. Okay, so let's look at verses 12 to 16. Can somebody read that please? Verses 12 to 16. For as many for as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not for not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature uh, by nature do the things in the in the law, these although have Although not having the law are a law to themselves. To 16? To 16, yes. I'm sorry, okay. um, who show the work of the who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their uh, conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts, accusing or else excusing them. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Thank you, Kung. So here in verses 12 to 16, Paul is saying that uh, he talks about how everyone will be judged. And then he, sa he says how the Jews will be judged. Now the Jews have the law. So he says he, they will be judged according to the law. And uh, the Gentiles, they don't have the law. Uh, but he says they too will be, they too will perish, uh, you know, without the law, which means they too will be judged uh, without, uh, even though they don't have the law. So. In verse 13, he says, you cannot just hear the law, but you need to keep the law in order to be justified. And so he's telling this to the uh, Jews that, you know, um, you just can't uh, have the law. You can't just know the law and teach the law, but you need to keep the law. If you don't keep the law, you will be judged according to the law. Now, what about the Gentiles? Now, the Gentiles or the Greeks, they don't have the law, only the Jews, you know, uh, were the privileged people who had the law. And... Um, Hence, uh, Paul is saying in verse, four, in verse 14, um, the Gentiles, he says, by nature, they do things pertaining to the law. So what does he mean by this? He's saying that the way people are designed, they are designed with something inside them. And the something with inside them tells them what they're doing is right or tells them what they're doing is wrong so what does he mean by saying by nature they do things pertaining to the law means he's saying that the way people are designed you know they're designed with something inside them uh, and there's something inside each one of us or so there's something inside all of us uh, by which we know what we are doing or saying or seeing or thinking is right or what is wrong so what is paul actually referring to um, what is does he refer, mean when he's saying that they don't have the law, but there is something inside them? In verse 15, he says, the law is written in their hearts. Now, what is this? So the law that is written in their hearts is their conscience. So their conscience is the law that is written, written in their hearts. That means they don't have the, the law, the physical law that has been given to them, like the Jews, but they have a law that is written in their hearts, and that law is their conscience. And their conscience tells them, this is okay, this is not okay, this is right, this is wrong. Okay, So every man is born with a conscience, Okay, a law that is written in their hearts. Okay, so every man is born with a conscience, a law that is in their hearts, and it's the capacity that's within them to know what is right and wrong, which is built into every person. That is how all of us are designed. We are designed with this conscience that is inside um, us. And now this conscience can be damaged, okay? Um, and our own ability to know what is right and wrong can be damaged. So how can it be damaged? If we continue to, uh, you know, when we do a sin, our conscience blows the whistle, so to say. Okay, uh, so the whistle blows loud. Now, when you hear the whistle, of course, in our Indian context, uh, you know, when you hear the whistle on the street, at a, you know, the traffic, we know it's the, the policeman who's blowing the whistle. And, you know, automatically we stop because we, 
we think, okay, maybe we've broken some law or, you know, some people know they have broken the law and they'll just, you know, they'll just speed or they'll just drive away. Now, just ride away. Uh, where else do we hear the whistle? You know, when we're running a race and, uh, you know, when the, uh, when, you know, we, uh, we're allowed to start, you know, uh, the whistle is blown, we all start the race and then if the, if somebody has a foul start, you know, the, the referee will, uh, blow the whistle loudly and we all know that's a foul start and we all get back to uh, the starting line or if you're playing football or any game we know that you know the uh, the referee um, uh, blows the whistle we know if we need to stop or it's a foul or whatever okay so uh, our conscience is like that whistle it blows loud the first time and uh, we don't heed that we don't listen to it we could we indulge in that sin we give in to that sin the second time when we are going to sin the whistle blows louder but this time it, uh, it blows but it's not much loud it's, it gets softer and softer and softer and softer to an extent where you know our conscience is dead to that sin and that is why we see people indulging in in some sinful activity and we say how can they even do that for example i've seen um uh, people, you know, uh, in the early in the morning, they're totally drunk. Instead of drinking tea, coffee in the morning, they start drinking um, alcohol, or you know, they uh, they're uh, uh, they're so addicted to uh, uh, to smoking that the whole day they're like a chimney pot, just smoking. They know that it's going to destroy their life. I've worked with drug addicts. I've worked with alcoholics. I've seen young men come to the de addiction center. You know, they just norm. They look normal. They're wearing their jeans, and then then they pull up their jeans. Their legs are like. Um, uh, elephant's legs because it's got gangrene you know they just come to the clinic get it cleaned and uh, they go back and inject it in the same place they know that it's got gangrene they know that their leg has to be amputated but how can they do it because their conscience is so dead to that part of them so you know um, our conscience can be damaged and when our conscience is damaged you know we lose our ability to know what is right and wrong and we indulge in sin and uh, we think it's okay you know it becomes part of us we think that's okay for us to do uh, and then Paul goes on to say that we need to remember that the conscience does not replace the gospel the conscience though the gentiles who do not have the law will be judged according to the conscience but the conscience is not an alternate law it does not replace the gospel so in verse 16 paul concludes by saying that god is going to judge the secrets of men according to my gospel so the judgment of god uh, which is a righteous judgment, which is an impartial judgment, which is a judgment according to the truth will be done according to the gospel of Jesus Christ and not according to the law of conscience, but the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we can ask the question, what happens to those who don't hear the gospel? How will they be judged? Um, now we, we, you know, so far in uh, chapters 1 and 2, uh, Paul has explained so far that there are people who have the law and there are people who don't have the law. And then he's go, he also has mentioned that there are two things in every person uh, telling them that there is a God and telling them that they need to seek the true and living God. So what are these two things that Paul mentions? So every person has a reason. Uh, and this he mentions in chapter 1, uh, which he says, through creation, every person can look at uh, creation. And when they look at creation, when they see creation, uh, they cannot deny the fact that there is a creator. Okay, there is a God who has created all this. And Paul also says in chapter 1 that the invisible attributes of God are seen, are seen in creation. So uh, there are two things that's there in every person, telling them there is a God, telling them that, that they have to seek the true and living God. And what is that Paul, the first thing Paul mentions is reason. Okay, true creation, every person can look at creation and know there's a creator and the invisible attributes of God are seen in creation. Now the second thing uh, is Paul says that every person there is a conscience. So the reason and conscience, whether they're Jews or Gentiles, Every person has reason, every person has conscience.
Okay, so these two things, reason and conscience in every person is directing us or is convicting us or telling us that there is a God that you should seek after this true and living God. Okay, so reason and conscience that is directing us, that is teaching us, that is convicting us, that is telling us that there is a God that everyone should seek this true and living God. Now, every person who follows their conscience and their reason and listens to their conscience and reasons and who seeks after this God, God in some way, we do not know how, but God in some way will bring the gospel to that person. Okay, so if a person dies without hearing the gospel, what will happen to them? Uh, true, they have the reason, they have the conscience. Uh, their conscience says there is a true and living God and you have to seek after him. Uh, but they never hear about Jesus Christ and they die. What happens to them? Now, all we can state according to what uh, the Holy Spirit has revealed to Paul and what he writes in verse 16 is everyone will be judged according to the gospel of Jesus Christ and no excuse, which means uh, will God have another way uh, another way to judge people who have never heard the gospel. Now, uh, scripture does not mention that. Hence, we cannot come up with another alternative. Uh, we cannot say things uh, which is not mentioned in the word of God. Um, uh, we, we don't have or we cannot come up with an alternate option. All we know is what uh, uh, the Holy Spirit has revealed to Paul in verse 16, where he says, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Okay, so everyone will be judged according to the um, gospel. Now we need to know this, okay, that the conscience is uh, an alternate, or conscience is an alternative to the law. And reason and conscience seeks to convict people and lead them to seek God, but everyone will be judged by the gospel of Jesus Christ and there is no option. So how will people who are mentally challenged uh, be judged? Well, uh, again, you know, uh, we cannot uh, say anything because we don't have that, uh, you know, God will judge them according to uh, the level that they are in or uh, the situation that they are in. Okay, so what we need to know from these verses is conscience is an alternate to the law or, or it's an alternative to the law. The reason and conscience seeks to convict people and lead them to seek God, but everyone will be judged by the gospel of Jesus Christ and there is no option. Uh, so what should we do? Um, uh, can we say that conscience is an alternative or a replacement to the gospel? No, that's not right. That's not the truth. Uh, you know, there are people who say that uh, Paul says that conscience is an alternative and a replacement to the gospel. No, it is not an alternative or a replacement to the gospel. Um, uh, but what is the gospel, you know, but what we read in verse 16 is that people will be judged according to the gospel. Now, what is a gospel? Uh, gospel is that we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Okay, so the gospel is simple. It's believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. What else is a gospel? Without Christ, there is no salvation. There is no given, uh, there's no name given to men by which they can be saved but the name of Jesus. Okay, so we cannot say that God will use conscience to judge people who have not heard the gospel. Uh, that is a wrong conclusion. Um, uh, but we know that everyone will, whether Jews, Greeks, Gentiles, will be judged according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is the importance here that we need to see the importance of us uh, or the need for us to share the gospel and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to everyone around us because everyone uh, needs to hear the gospel because everyone will be judged based on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? And in verse 17, um, you know, this, there's a strong rebuke to the Jews. Um, 
Paul is saying, uh, you Jews, you're resting and relying on the law and boasting uh, in God about the law, the covenants that you've received, the covenant of uh, uh, circumcision, but you yourself are not following the law. And in verse 18, he says, um, you know, we know his will, we can tell what is right and wrong. And Paul is telling them, you know what is right and wrong, you're teaching it, but you yourself are doing this, and hence you are breaking the law. So here we see that Paul is building up his case here. Okay, very logically, he's building up his case here. He's telling the Jews, Jews, it's true that you have the law. You know everything in the law, but you're also breaking the law. And he says, because you're doing this, you know, the name of God is being blasphemed among the Greeks, among the Gentiles. Okay, because you have the law, you know the law, you teach the law, but you don't keep the law yourself, then you are basically blaspheming the name of God, your uh, self. So that is what he goes on to talk about in verse uh, uh, 24. I think we just read up to verse uh, 21, right? We read verses, uh, we read verses, uh, we read only verses 12 to 16. Verses 12 to 16. Okay, we'll, uh, can somebody read verses 17 to verse 29, please? Let me read verses uh, 17 to 29. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knoweth his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that Thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore, which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself. Thou that preachest a man should not steal, does you steal. Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, does thou commit adultery. Thou that abhorrest Idols, does thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. For circumcision verily profiteth, if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, Shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Thank you, Susan. So here we see in this verses, you know, Paul is saying, verse 17, he is rebuking the Jews. Uh, you can, he's saying, you know, you, uh, you teach the law, you know the law, but you yourself break it. And he says, you who say do not commit adultery, you yourself commit adultery. And he says, you know, don't uh, worship idols and you, you yourself are robbing in the temple of God. And uh, he says by doing all of this, you know, you're be becoming um, blaspheming the name of God. And here, you know, like I said in the introduction, uh, Paul quotes a lot of Old Testament scripture because he was uh, well trained, well taught in the Old Testament. And so he says, as it is written, you know, he's, he's, um, uh, uh, he's quoting an Old Testament scripture here. It says, the name of God is blasphemed among you. And then verses 25 to 29, he goes on uh, to talk about the issue of circumcision uh, with the Jews are very proud of. Uh, and he says, you know, uh, because they knew that circumcision uh, was a sign of a covenant uh, with the Jews and with uh, God. So it, uh, the Jews say that uh, we are circumcised and circumcision is a sign of the covenant uh, uh, with us and God. And, um, and uh, uh, you know, um, 
and Paul is telling them, uh, look here, you know, you have the circumcision, uh, you know it's a covenant between you and God, and uh, when you're breaking the law and you don't keep the law, you're not doing what the right thing, you're not doing what is right in God's sight, then uh, the circumcision, which is a, a covenant between God and you, which is a physical sign of the covenant, which, which is with, between God and you, basically amounts to nothing. Okay, so there's no point in being proud of uh, the covenant of circumcision that you have, uh, uh, you know, which is a sign of a covenant between you and God. Uh, when you yourself are not keeping the law and breaking the law, then, you know, the circumcision, which is a physical sign of your covenant with God, actually or basically amounts to uh, nothing. And then Paul goes on to say that if the uncircumcised, that is the Gentiles, you know, uh, uh, well, if they keep the law, or they do things that are right, then shouldn't we say that uh, their in uncircumcision is good as being circumcised? So even as uh, even if they're not un uh, circumcised, and uh, the Gentiles still keep the law, they follow the law, they do what is right, then can't we say that they are good as being circumcised? Size, because what they're doing is right before God. And then verses 28 to 29, Paul uh, says what really matters uh, before God is not, you know, uh, circumcision of the flesh, which means he's not just saying it's a physical circumcision of the outward circumcision that God is interested in, or not just holding on to a covenant and boasting about it. Uh, it's not something that is physical, outwardly, not of the flesh, but he's saying that it's the change of heart, a heart change, okay? Um, and uh, he's saying that, you know, a change of heart, which is more important to God. And the Jews knew this because they knew that, you know, um, that God will remove from them a heart of stone and give them a heart of uh, flesh. And they knew this very well. They knew this Old Testament scripture. They knew that it's what God is going to do with them. So the inward change, that is what is important. Paul is saying, so the inward circumcision of the heart, you know, uh, is, is more important. A change in heart, change in the attitudes uh, of the heart. Um, and uh, that is more important and not just physical uh, circumcision. So he just builds up on this whole uh, argument and this uh, whole discussion in a very logical way and uh, he goes on to say that it's not the law, uh, you know, you can boast about the law, you Jews, you Gentiles, you say you don't have the law, so how will we be judged? You'll be judged according to your conscience. But then he goes on to say in verse 16 that it's not the law or the conscience that we will be judged by, but we will be judged by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he builds on uh, about the circumcision. He says that God is not just interested in the flesh or the physical circumcision, but the circumcision of the heart, the inward change of the heart, um, that God is more interested in. That is what he's going to do. He's going to remove the heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Okay, So this is very um, uh, briefly about... Um, uh, you know, Romans chapter 2, we, if you notice, we just did more like uh, uh, a study of, uh, we, or we examined this in a very different approach from what we will be doing from the rest of uh, the other uh, passages or the other chapters. Instead of examining this chapter verse by verse, we just, uh, you know, presented the main uh, uh, insights or the main truths from uh, were presented from this chapter. So we see in this chapter, uh, you know, Paul challenging the attitude of uh, Jews uh, towards Gentiles. Uh, he was presenting an understanding of God's judgment, how, what, and when. Uh, he was revealing the work of the conscience. He was presenting who a Jew is, a true Jew is not somebody who circumcised uh, uh, the flesh or the physical circumcision, but of the heart. Uh, and so this is what he presents in this entire chapter okay so we just look at the notes uh, i know that i just uh, shared a lot of things that uh, you know not just follow the notes but we'll just go through the notes um so in the notes we see that you know he's uh, if you look at your pdf um in in this uh, chapter uh, paul is challenging the attitudes of the jews towards uh, gentiles um 
the Jews, uh, you know, who have the law and the Gentiles who don't have the law. Um, and uh, Paul uses the word Greek here, um, uh, you know, which, uh, which basically means, uh, you know, Gentiles in general. Okay, so um, in summary of all that is stated in Romans chapter 2, Paul challenges uh, the Jew uh, and their attitude by stating that uh, judging others requires that I must hold myself accountable to the same standards. Judging others and practicing the wrong I condemn will not permit me to escape God's judgment. Uh, and then we also saw that it's the goodness of God, uh, the forbearance of God, that is uh, the to his tolerance, waiting for change, willingness to put up with um, and the patience of God that leads people to repentance. We saw this in Romans chapter 2, verse 4. And we also saw that God's uh, judgment is righteous, is without partiality, uh, but his judgment is on all who do evil, Jews first and gen the Gentiles. Uh, Jews first because I said they were given the oracles or they were given the laws by God first. And then Paul says those who have the law, uh, God will judge them according to the law, but uh, God has his own way determined to do, to judge those outside the law. Okay, so then he goes on to say that the Jews are very proud that they have the law, the circumcision, which is the sign of covenant. And Paul makes it clear that just having these things or just hearing the law will not amount to anything if they don't keep the law, if they don't follow the law. And then he goes on to talk about... Uh, uh, you know, an understanding of God's judgment. I'm just uh, falling through the notes. I've explained everything, but uh, just thought, you know, we just look at the notes and see what, uh, if you missed out anything. Okay. So he presents an understanding of God's judgment, how, what, and when. So Paul states how God judges in verse 2 of chapter 2. He says he will, God will judge us according to the truth. And we know the God's word is truth. In verse 5, it will be a righteous judgment. Verse 11 of chapter 2, he says, without partiality. And in chapter, verse 16 of chapter 2, he says, we will all be judged according to the gospel. Okay. Then Paul goes on to mention what God judges. Okay. In verses 6 to 11, he will judge our deeds. Uh, in verse 7, he says, our desire, uh, seeking our own desires, because of that we will be judged. And then we will also be judged in verse 16, what drives our motives or motivations uh, of the things that inspires us. Okay, and uh, in your notes, there's a, uh, uh, it's mentioned about First Corinthians uh, chapter 4, verse 5. You know, where Paul says, therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels. That means God will reveal the purposes and the motives of people's hearts. So God will reveal your purpose and your motives. Then each one's praise will come from God. Okay. So when God judges, um, was uh, 5 of chapter 2 says the day of wrath was 16 the day when God will judge so uh, we know from uh, this chapter that there is an appointed time when God will bring about his uh, judgment and then we looked at uh, the revealing work of uh, the conscience okay I've already explained all that uh, to us um, uh, you know, that we are all created or designed uh, something in us which tells us about what is right and wrong, and that is our conscience. And uh, our conscience convicts us. Um, in your notes, there's an example given from John chapter 8, verse 9, uh, you know, when uh, the Pharisees uh, and the teachers of the law, they brought a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. And they said, they told Jesus that, you know, uh, such a woman, uh, the law says that she should be stoned. And um, what do you say? And they want to catch Jesus. Uh, so Jesus said that, you know, um, um, if uh, any one of you are without sin here, be the first one to take the stone and throw it at the woman. And uh, we see that everyone leaves. Uh, and those who heard of it, you know, they were convicted by their conscience and they all left one by one. 
uh, beginning from the oldest to the least. And when Jesus was left alone with the woman uh, standing there in his uh, in midst, he says, neither do I condemn you, go and live your life without uh, sin. So here is an example that just shows us that, you know, our conscience uh, convicts us of our uh, sin. And all the other uh, that notes that are there in the PDF, I've explained that to you, conscience instead of the gospel. Uh, the two inbuilt indicators, I talked about reason and conscience, I've explained that to you as well. We move on to see the uh, conditions um, of the conscience. Now, in various places in scripture, um, uh, you know, um, uh, individual, you know, we see from various places in scripture that individually the conscience can be in different conditions. So each one of our conscience individually can be in different conditions. Uh, we can have a good conscience, um, a conscience that is functioning properly. Uh, it's serving its God intended purpose uh, to tell the person what is right and wrong. The person is listening to their conscience and doing what is uh, right and not doing what is wrong. So their conscience is functioning properly. So that is a good conscience that can, we can see in some individuals. Um, some individuals also have conscience without offense. That means their conscience has not been violated. They have uh, not done anything wrong in that area of their life. Their conscience is not violated. Uh, some of our conscience is a pure conscience, is a clear conscience, no offense. Okay, so you know, um, uh, uh, you know, we can begin off our life journey when we accept the Lord Jesus as our personal savior with a good conscience, uh, a conscience that is uh, good, which is without offense. With with, uh, which is pure. But over time, if you're not careful, uh, then our conscience uh, becomes weak if you give in to sin. Uh, and uh, no longer our, uh, vo our conscience has a strong voice uh, to and tells the person what is right and wrong, but our conscience becomes weak now. And they're not listening to our conscience. So our conscience becomes has no strong voice. It becomes weak. And we're not following our conscience. Then our conscience begins to get weak. And once it becomes weak, it uh, also becomes a seared conscience. It can grow from becoming a weak conscience to becoming a, a seared conscience. What is the meaning of a seared conscience? It means a conscience that is almost dead. You know, we had, our conscience is dead to that part of us. That's why we can see, you know, a terrorist uh, taking a gun and just shooting uh, people randomly, not even looking if it's a woman, a pregnant woman, a child, a baby, an infant. Why? Because their conscience is seared, which means their conscience is dead to that part of them. Then the conscience can grow from a weak to a seared to a defiled conscience, where uh, it's basically thinking wrong. Because the truth has been uh, covered by uh, wrong, and um, is uh, you know our, our thinking is veiled. Darkness covers our thinking, and finally it becomes an evil conscience, where we permit to do evil, or we are living evil lives, or we are living lives that are wrong and evil and not pleasing um, in the sight of God. Okay, so what we can conclude from the study on conscience is that our conscience from go from can move from uh, uh, or can go from God's original state uh, 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 to a state where it's completely dead and defiled and become becomes evil. Okay, so it, it goes from good. Uh, uh, to encouraging a person to do evil. So we need to be very uh, careful of our conscience. We need to listen uh, to our conscience. But, um, you know, even though our conscience and reasons are um, uh, two things that uh, have been given to us uh, to help us to know the truth, to seek the truth, to know the true and living God, but yet, you know, uh, it's not the conscience that will judge us, but it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, so that is uh, chapter two. We did not look at it, uh, uh, you know, verse by verse or phrase by phrase or word study. We just did a, you know, a thematic study. We'll be just following this in this chapter, but in other chapters we will be doing a verse and word study. Any questions about chapter two?
I hope you all understood chapter two. All of you are very quiet. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you, Rupa. Any questions you have about chapter two? Pastor, can I? Yeah, sure, Sri Kumar. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, Pastor, uh, I just want to know as we as we discuss right now about the conscious uh, and how the God is going to judge them. So in that case, um, the people, uh, um, I'm just asking about Jews, uh, not Gentiles. So uh, in that case, the people who are following uh, Jewish law, so uh, we, uh, how God will judge them? Like, you know, did uh, God judge them based on only on their law and permit them to enter into the heaven or uh, so because they have not accepted Jesus, they will be like removed to hell. That is something which I want to know. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, here we need to see, uh, we need to understand that the law for the Jews helps them to know what is right and wrong. Okay. And also the conscience helps those who don't have the law to know what is right and wrong. But also Paul says that there are two things that we have, reason and conscience. The reason and conscience basically, what do the reason and conscience do? The reason and conscience, you know, it, uh, it helps us to, um, uh, you know, uh, it directs us, it convicts us, or it uh, tells us that there is a God. And it tells us to seek the true and um, living God. But... As the, the law, the conscience you know, helps us know what is right and wrong. It, uh, it directs and teaches and guide, helps us to, uh, to seek the true and living God. Uh, and when we seek the true and living God, you know, God promises that he would reveal himself to all who seek him. All who seek him will find him. But verse 16, Paul says that we will not be judged, uh, you know, according to the law, the, the final judgment, we will be judged according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, we don't have anything much about uh, that. We can't speculate much. We can't form theories. Uh, we can't come up with alternatives because, uh, you know, if we come up with any of those things, we will, uh, you will be misinterpreting the word of God, going against the word of God. But how God is going to do this, uh, we really do not know, but we know that, you know, the gospel, that Jesus will judge everyone according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. What we need to know for us ourselves is the urgency of us to take the gospel, to share the gospel uh, with others so that people do not land up in eternal fire or hell. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, Sri Kumar. Anyone else has any questions? No questions? Okay, so next week we'll, uh, uh, I mean on Friday we'll begin to look at chapter 3. Uh, but um, just a brief background to chapter 3. We saw in chapter 2 that uh, you know, Paul is telling the Jews, you have the law and the circumcision, but it's of no use because you know it, you teach it, but you don't keep it, and hence it's no use. You're, being a, you know, you're blaspheming God before uh, the Gentiles. And then what he's building up, uh, what, uh, what he started in chapter 2, uh, you know, he continues to discuss about that. Uh, in chapter 3. Okay, so what he's built up in chapter 2, he continues to discuss that in chapter 3. He says, uh, he tells the Jew, but you are important. You know, um, uh, we are the ones, Paul is saying we because he's a Jew. So he says, uh, you know, we are the ones who God has given the law. And um, and so we are important. We are still important in God's sight, even though you know um, we don't keep the law, we don't believe in Him. And uh, for the time being, you know, uh, God has given the authority to the church. But what what gets to at in chapter three is um, neither Jew nor Gentile is perfect before God. Uh, he says, you know, he's built this all up. He says, you know. Uh, none of us are perfect before God. We've all sinned before God. No one is righteous before God. 
um, and having established this, then he gets into the gospel message. So he's already established the fact that both Jews and Gentiles and Greeks, you know, have uh, are not perfect. There's sin before God. There's no one righteous before God. He's established this, and now he gets into the gospel message. As I told you, that Romans, uh, you know, Paul um, is it, it's a. It, uh, Epistle to the Romans uh, is a, a very important book where it uh, talks about in detail about the gospel message. We can't find this any in, in any other epistles. So he gets into the gospel message where he says God has made a way for both the Jews and the Gentiles to be forgiven. And then he goes on to talk about the redemption in Jesus, uh, how it's freely can be received by grace. And then in chapter 4, he says that we receive this by only by faith. Um, and um, he says that we are all sinners. God has provided a way. Uh, uh, but in chapter 4, he says it's only by faith that we receive it. And in chapter 5, he goes on to say that it's uh, by grace that we uh, receive this um, uh, forgiveness that, uh, that we receive the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God is imputed on us. Uh, because of his grace, which he talks about in chapter 5. But in uh, chapter 4, he mentions about uh, that we receive this in faith. But in chapter 3, he builds on, you know, uh, the gospel message that God has made a way for both the Jews and the Greeks to be forgiven. So we look at this in chapter 3. Okay, before we end class, anyone has any questions? Any more questions? No questions? OK, if there's no questions, we'll end class here. Thank you all for joining class. And I'll see you on uh, Friday. Have a blessed day. God bless. Thank you, Mark. God bless you. Thank you, Elisha. Thank you, Kung. Thank you, Mangi.